here we are in the Nature House Garden. Welcome to 30 years of growing and collecting in over 20 countries around the world in the equatorial belt from Borneo through Brazil. Uh, it's such an honor to have plants that you've grown from infancy to giant behemoths like the huge platycerium you see behind me. This is platycerium superbum. It was the size of a fist 31 years ago. It has never gone below 45 degrees. It makes these enormous leaf shields, two to catch the monkey dung and the leaf litter, and then two to come out with a spore patch for asexual reproduction and these huge antlers. It is one of the largest in North America. And to my right is the beautiful Renanthera. It's very difficult to grow. They freeze at 60. Um, this is Philippinensis, a species that grows in trees meandering 20, 30 feet with numerous inflorescences. Renanthera from the Philippines. Now we're going to take a little walk and see some of the incredible pieces of orchids and palms and bromeliads that are here at the Nature House Garden. I'm going to give you the deluxe tour. Are you ready? Let's go. Talk about beauty, unparalleled beauty in this Ascascenda. Look at the overlapping sepals and petals, the even burnt tangerine color, the little red labellum, the little face. These Ascascendas are free flowering and will often flower two and three times a year. Behind me, which is beautiful in the evening, is a clamshell I harvested from the South China Sea that was killed by people who harvest the abductor mussel for sale on the sushi market called Mirugai. We'll have to come back and take a peek at this garden in the evening. It'll take your breath away. Another little section of the Nature House garden, something that really came out good. In the center is Portia Jungles. This inflorescence is almost three and a half months old. It is one of the most beautiful upright Portias you could use in a garden and can take full sun in winter. To the left of me, check this out. Look at this fantastic platycerium. The platyceriums come from Southeast Asia, Vietnam, Cambodia, with one species even occurring in equatorial Africa. This one just flush its big lobby antlers to gather sunlight. And look at the way the, the leaf shield, you can see the cellular structure like some giant emergent amoeba. It's very organic and very beautiful and very artistic. The shape, the color, the veining. It's hard to beat a well-grown platycerium and they're not easy to grow. This takes orchid growing to a whole new level. My friend Banjong, a very successful Thai breeder from Bangkok in Thailand, fires these pots in Chiang Mai, northern Thailand, then imports the plants, and two years later they root directly into the terracotta jardinere. So when you drop off this piece for a client, the vase is the very thing sh that the plant is growing in and on, illustrating the epiphytic nature of how the roots use to cling to trees. This is a Vanda cerulea hybrid coming from Chiang Mai. As you can see, the beautiful tessellation. That barring you see is called tessellation, and it's one of the things that gives Vandas their spectacular tropical look. This is two plants together, which will eventually grow and carry several inflorescences at a time and will be beautiful. Talk about wicked. <laughs> I believe this hybrid is, comes from Hannibal Lecter is one of the parents. It is incredibly spiny, another plant grown more for its foliage. This plant will probably double in size over the next few years, but that jungle book barring is so beautiful and hard to beat. Let's move on into the garden, shall we? Earlier, I displayed this in a beautiful home to show how nice it is to see an assembly of Talansi bromeliads. These are all species, hence the bowl is called evolution, since all of these pieces have evolved to look like this. And the flower, probably pollinated by euglacine bees or hummingbirds. The Talansiers are such interesting shapes, the architecture, the snakiness, the spideriness, contrasting with the beautiful wave curry bowls from Vietnam, make for a stunning garden accent. This is truly a piece de resistance. You know what? This is why people grow orchids, because they're absolutely dazzling when they're properly exhibited. This is an Odonta Glossum hybrid. The parents probably come from 3,000 feet in the Andes Mountains. 
They have that beautiful rust colored barring, branching inflorescences, and these are young plants only in six inch pots. But when you smash them all together, highlight them with lime green reindeer moss, and put them in a red curry bowl from Vietnam to perfectly match the color that's in the sepals and petals. It's a very striking centerpiece and something that celebrates the diversity of life. This is another hybrid that came out of Bullis bromeliads and it produces an upright tangerine inflorescence with little lemon-lime mustard candy corns that come out. This is quite young now. It'll double in size in the next month or two to come. Uh, Acmes are very long-lasting, sometimes holding their color for almost three months. So that's an excellent plant. Sometimes it's hard to beat bromeliads for bedding plants. This particular one is Vrija splenrite. It's a primary hybrid. It's grown for its foliage with that beautiful jungle book barring with chocolate and mint. It's outstanding even when not in flower. But in the next two months, these will produce upright red feather pendants, about two feet tall, which will eventually burst forth with undulating yellow flower bundles as they flower in succession every few days. And these flowers will probably last several months. We'll have to come back and take a look at this because it is the bomb. Every so often, a plant comes along that just rocks the plant world. And this is it. This is Echmea blue tango, one of the finest bromeliads, in my opinion, in the world. It was originally a species called uh, Diclamedia trinitensis from Trinidad, although the mother produced a pendant inflorescence. However, when the seeds were collected and grown out, one or two of the plants produced an absolutely upright inflorescence, making it more commercially viable and better for landscape gardeners and designers. This blue tango produces a strawberry rhubarb stem with electric blue feathers that will grow out another two inches and another four inches tall, lasting months in flower. It's like having a group of peacocks in your garden. Truthfully, one of my favorite plants, you put in five or six Australian tree ferns and slam in 15 of these underneath, and it looks like you're back in Jurassic Park or the Wizard of Oz, or something in between. All right, all right, I admit it, I'm cheating. I'm actually sitting on a fireball. But anytime I see something with a 14 inch depression, I stuff it with the most beautiful tropical plants I can find. <laughs> in this case, they're beautiful Asiatic dendrobiums with creamy ivory sepals and petals, and that electric purple lip. There's 15 spikes or so. This will stay in flower for many months. And it's just framed with a bit of coral rock that I farmed underneath an avocado plantation in Homestead. And this funky little Neolithic image to make it an art garden. It's really not that hard. A little bit of style, a little bit of luck, a lot of passion, and you have a garden. Let's go see more, huh? No matter how good you think you are when you're landscaping and designing a tropical garden, Mother Nature always comes in and just smashes you. I put in these little Acmea del Mars, beautiful reindeer moss and fireball near jellias, and a tropical Phaeus orchid in the background. But Mother Nature took over and rocketed up these little Sansevieria knives directly through my clamshell I harvested in the South China Sea. And it's just such a celebration of texture and shape and color, and it's flanked by coral from the South China Sea. This is a very little special slice of life. One of the nice things about a tropical garden is that every angle is different. Whether you're looking out, you're looking in, you're looking sideways, there's always something in the rich tapestry to take your breath away. It's all about color, shape, size, proportion, a little bit of luck, I think that goes without saying. But let's, uh, let's go take a look at the garden from a different angle. Well, my last exhibition, there was one piece that I was thoroughly delighted did not sell. <laughs> and it's this smashing Oncidium Tropic Thunder. Look at the size of these enormous swollen pseudobulbs. The huge carbohydrate reserve stored up during rainy season is now being used to launch this rocket, which will grow up eight feet tall, sporting 30 more branches and bearing several hundred yellow flowers. We call the Juvia de Oro, 
shower of gold or las bailarinas because the little flowers look like little ballerinas. You'll have to check back in about two months when this is in full flower because it takes a long time for this inflorescence to open up. But uh, it's just nice to see from time to time such a well-grown plant. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Well, it looks like camouflage comes in not just clothes, but in the form of the voodoo lily from Southeast Asia. <clears throat> this awesome plant produces a beautiful camouflage trunk and one huge modified leaf. In about two months, it, this will all turn to mush and just rot. It'll take a nap for a while, and then this filthy black death bud will rip out of the pot, burst open two feet across, stinking of dead rotting meat. And the smell of carrion is what is used to attract flies, its principal pollinator, the voodoo lily from Southeast Asia. How cool is that? Huh. Check these bad boys out. This is the genus of Nepenthes, the pitcher plants, which come from Southeast Asia. I recently found seven or eight different species in the wild in Kota Kinabalu on the famous mountain in Borneo. They have this little leaf, mod it's, this is basically a modified leaf and the insects when they walk into here they slip and fall in and I slowly digest it inside. You can see that water mixes with digestive juices and the plant feeds itself from the little larvae and mosquito larvae and salamanders and frogs and wasps, anything that lands inside and slips in because they can't escape. It's, uh, as they say in the West Indies, it's nature doing that. <laughs> Uh-oh, intruder alert, intruder alert. <laughs> We've got a rogue dragon fruit cactus. Well, we can't have this. And I'll tell you why. This can grow better somewhere else. But this palm, is one massive behemoth. This is Caryota gigas, the single trunk high altitude fishtail palm from Luang Prabang, from Laos. It will grow into an enormous size and girth and in about 30 years drop its enormous woody fronds and produce a massive towering inflorescence weighing half a ton and then the tree will die as the seeds scatter. This is truly one of the world's most beautiful ornamental palms. Every frond is an event. This palm is hard to beat. This is Bismarckia nobilis from Madagascar. This will grow 80 feet tall and bearing distinctly different male and female flowers. They're sexually dimorphic. It's cold tolerant into the upper 20s, so it's a wonderful landscape palm for central Florida and is used in leading gardens and is found in botanical gardens around the world. It has a beautiful silver trunk covered with little koala bear butt fuzz and is a remarkably stately palm, which will enhance any landscape. Bismarckia nobilis. Welcome to Roots or Us. <laughs> you know you only really get this look when you've been growing plants for 10 and 15 years and the roots ramble out of the crates, giving that ancient lost city look. This is my rare plant house here at Nature House where I cultivate over 150 different species of orchids and bromeliads collected in the tropical equatorial rain belt. They get misted every day, misted every afternoon, fertilized every Sunday. That's called culture, and good culture makes plants that look like this.